morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to have you here this morning. And for those of you joining us by way of video, we're glad to have you as well. We hope the message from the Lord this morning will be uplifting to you and encouraging, perhaps challenging. We pray that, that God will bless you in all that we do here this morning. So last week we talked about um, what it is to, to live out our calling what it is to live out our calling as Christians, what is it our, to, to live out our calling as disciples, and there's a particular context in which that question was set. So let me invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians this morning, where we, we read last week and we read again today about the ministry of reconciliation that God has given us. You may remember, uh, if you were here with us, uh, that in my in my message to you, in the, in the word that the Lord put on my heart, I was fully expecting to preach on Philemon. Um, that's what I had studied, that's what I prepared, and was fully expecting to preach on that, and the Lord had me preach on everything leading up to that, but never got into Philemon this morning. And so my intention, Lord willing, is to preach on Philemon this morning, but I want to go back and give you what I see as a context to properly help or help us to properly focus on the hearing and reading of Philemon. So I invite you again back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where, where Paul is, is talking to the Corinthian church about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And so we're looking at, uh, starting in verse 14, where Paul writes, For Christ's love compels us. In some versions or translations, it may read, for, God, for Christ's love controls us. It's a significant word. It's a, it's a strong word. It is not just a, a light suggestion. It's a deep-seated compelling that Christ's love does in us. And the reason is because we're convinced that one died for all being Jesus, Jesus died for all, all who would receive him. And therefore, all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, worldly being a human perspective. We don't view anybody that way anymore. Those of us who have accepted what Jesus has done for us, those who have invited him into our hearts and our lives to be Lord and Master, we are to see people differently now, not according to a human or not from a human perspective. Even though we once regarded Christ that way, and Paul is referring to those who were with him at the time, who saw him as the human Jesus that he is, but regarded him from human perspective. In other words, the values that are inherent in this world, the things that we consider important, this is the way we looked at him until he rose again. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Obviously, if you're viewing Jesus from a human perspective, if you're viewing what he did and why he did it from a human perspective, you would have reason to say he failed and failed miserably. I mean, if he claimed to be the Savior, if he claimed to be the Messiah, well, what are the results? If you're one of those on the ground watching him hanging on the cross, dying, no one from a worldly standpoint, no one from a human perspective would say, hey, success! Just as he said, lift it up, right? Uh, not the way we were expecting. And yet, when he was resurrected from the dead, it rearranged everything. If you can receive, everything changed. Therefore, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, which is really a strange thing for us to hear today. I, I really believe that. I don't know about you, I haven't taken a poll, but I have struggled with that all my life. 
or all of my adult life anyway, what does it mean to be in Christ? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The NIV 2011 translates it this way. I said it the way I've memorized it. The old NIV. But the new NIV, scratch that, the 2011 NIV, translates it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. It is actually a better reading that we know now because it gets at the radical change that the resurrection of Jesus brought about. A radical change. Not just a change in the person. A change in everything. Everything. Nothing excluded. We believe, you and I as Christians, that God created the world. He created the world how? He spoke it into existence. The Word. And so we believe that Jesus as the living Word was with God in the beginning. John tells us that. And that all of creation came about through Christ the second person of the Trinity, the one who was with God in the beginning and who celebrated Christmas became the human Jesus. It's substantial in recognizing that in the recreation, if you will, the resurrection, the one who was dead genuinely and is now alive, though he was the same, was changed. This is old news for people who have been Christians for a long time. This is old news for mature Christians. And yet I want to present to you this morning a challenge to reconsider that. Not just today, but in the next few days as it's on your mind. I want you to give some thought to what does that mean? That all of creation, just as in the beginning, came about through God. So has the new creation and it's already begun. In raising Jesus from the dead, new creation has come. It's a startling thing to consider. Because as we look around us, do you see it? It looks like the same place to me. What has changed? The old is gone, Paul says. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Somehow, the new creation is to be most evident, at least at this point, through us. Through the reconciling work God has done in you and me. The reconciling work God has offered to anyone who would accept Jesus. Now, this requires you to think about some things. It requires us, first of all, to, to accept the notion that we were separated from God in the first place. I mean, the truth is, how, why would you need to be reconciled if you didn't have any reason to be reconciled? If you were still with God in good relationship, why would you need to be reconciled? So it's this, this whole passage, this whole premise is... is causing us or, or counting on us to assume that we were separated from God. And as Christians, we say, well, of course we were, because when, when we sin, the first human sin, that sin then permeated all future humans. And therefore, any sin separating us from God resulted in all humans being separated from God. This is kind of the basics of Christianity. You might call it Christianity 101. Humanity sinned. We were separated from God. And the Bible is a story of how God has been reaching out to us, trying to draw us back in. Culminating, climaxing, if you will, in the event of Jesus and in his resurrection, in this recreating, everything has changed. So now God has given to all of us who follow him, all of us who accept Jesus, 
the living, risen Jesus, He's given us this ministry of reconciling others. That's the challenge. How do we grasp that responsibility? What does that look like? I mean, candidly, it's hard enough to understand it, right? To get your head wrapped around that. But then to live it out? To somehow allow God to change our perspective so that living in the same world, we see it differently. To experience the same cultures, the same values, the same challenges, the same diseases, the same wars, the same etc. Somehow we are to see through different eyes. We are to experience from a different perspective. We are called to engage with others in a totally new way. Now, that being the context, I want you to flip to Philippians. Excuse me. Philemon. Yes. Philippians for another day. Flip over to Philemon, this short little letter right before Hebrews. This too is written by Paul. And whereas many of Paul's letters in the New Testament were written to a large group addressing different concerns, Philemon is written to a church, a house church, we'll talk about in just a minute, but for a personal reason, regarding a personal relationship. You see, Paul was imprisoned. We don't exactly know where. There's different opinions about that. Some think he was in, in prison in Rome when he wrote this because he was obviously in prison in Rome. However, others believe he was in Ephesus. The reality is Paul was in prison in a number of places as he went through his ministry. So we're really not sure. But we believe Ephesus because, as you can tell from the first part of this, this letter, Paul is writing, a prisoner of Jesus tells us he was in prison, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Well, you may know already that the letter Paul wrote to the Colossian church which you can find a few books back, a few letters back, mentions these same people. Scholars believe that actually Colossians, the letter to the Colossian church, was written about the same time this letter to Philemon was written. So we think this was written to a house church that Philemon was actually sponsoring, if you will. They were meeting in his house. That's what we believe is happening. And Paul is writing to Philemon about a personal concern. But the fact that he mentions these others says that he's writing, even though it's a personal concern he's writing about, it's to be read by everybody. It's to be read in the whole church. All of those in this house church are to hear it. And he talks about, in opening up this letter, as is often the case, he, he extends his greeting of grace and peace from God and from Jesus. And he thanks them because of what he has heard. Now I'm giving you a lot of detail this morning because when you read somebody else's letter, and sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what they mean because let's face it, the letter wasn't written by you and it's not written to you. And so you may be missing a lot of the details in the relationship between the two people. And sometimes when we read in scripture, it's a little hard to know words that can be used for multiple meanings, well, what they are. Like, for example, in a personal letter you're going to write to somebody, you're going to use the word you, right? I'm writing to you, and I'm going to talk about you. But it's written to a bunch of people. So does he mean you, one, or you, a bunch? And you'd have to know the Greek in this instance, which I won't bore you with. But those who know tell us that in the first instance in, in verse 3 grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ is written in the singular it's a singular you excuse me it's a plural you it's written to everybody it's a plural you the only other places in the whole letter 
Where it's plural is at the very end in verse 22 and verse 25. In other words, he is writing this letter to a bunch of people. But it's written specifically to Philemon because of a particular concern that's on Paul's heart. Okay, I give you that because as you're reading this, it's important to know to whom Paul is addressing. So he thanks God every time he remembers Philemon. Well, what is the relationship? How would we know? We have reason to believe that, that Paul maybe doesn't know Philemon personally. Maybe he hasn't met him personally. You think that? It's hard to tell, isn't it? He's writing this letter and it sounds like there's a very personal relationship. I thank my God every time I remember you, but frankly, you can remember someone by knowing about them. Maybe even knowing them through direct correspondence but without actually having met them in person. In fact, what he goes on to say is that he's heard a lot about him. He's heard about Philemon's love for all the people. He's heard about the way in which Philemon has refreshed others' hearts. Philemon is a member of this church. Philemon is obviously a person of Christ who loves the people he is around. And he's loving them not just in his head or his emotions, but in his actions. He's blessing them. He's encouraging them, verse 7 says. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Paul is appealing to Philemon through this personal relationship that he has, even though we don't know exactly how it came about, even though we don't know exactly the nature of it. Then he writes, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you. Wow, that's strong language, right? What is it telling us about him? Apparently, the relationship between the two is such that both Philemon and Paul would understand Paul is in a superior position. That's important to know because of what's going to come next. I could order you. He says, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Already in this letter, we're hardly into it. Already in this, there's lots of talk about love. Philemon's love for the people that he's with. Paul's love for Philemon. Philemon's love for Paul. They have a relationship of love. And that's the basis for the appeal. And then he goes on to talk a little bit more about their relationship trying to remind Philemon, just to bring to his attention, hey, we do have a relationship. And because I'm an older man and I'm in prison, you know, you have reason to... Re I'm in prison for what we're doing. I'm in prison for sharing the gospel. I'm in prison for the same thing you're doing. We are sharing the love of God and it's landed me in prison if I'm Paul. And so we're discussing the contents of this letter in light of the relationship of love. In light of a relationship of similar understanding. Then he comes to the appeal. I appeal to you for my son On Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Obviously, Paul is, is referring to a past relationship, a relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. A relationship that in some ways had become null and void in the sense that Onesimus apparently was of no use to him. Now he speaks of him as becoming useful not only to Philemon, but also to Paul. What's going on here? Well, let me fill in a little background because I don't intend to go through this whole thing, this whole letter in such a way this morning. Onesimus had been a slave, a slave to Philemon. And when I first read this letter, it really took me aback 
I don't know what you think, but I'm going to guess, living in the culture we do, that when you hear talk about slaves, it has a negative sense in you. It has a negative connotation. Slavery is not something that we applaud any longer. As a matter of fact, those of us who are Christians in this country, along with a number of other people, look back now on our history's past where we not only embraced, but we were a part of, our ancestors were a part of slavery in an awful way, an awful way. The slavery that took place in America was horrendous. And the ongoing effects have been the same. We've seen the result of such horrendous action. So it would be natural for someone living in this context to read this letter and to look at this and think, okay, if, if Onesimus had been a slave, if he had been, in some translations it speaks of him being a servant, but if, if he was in fact a slave, well, how in the world is Paul writing in a context of love here? So it's important. It was important to me. Maybe it is to you to know that, yes, there was slavery back then, but it was different than ours. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time this morning, although we will at some point, discussing the issue of slavery. Because today, in fact, slavery is as big a problem in this world as it's ever been. So in no way do I want those of you who are here or those of you listening by video, watching by video, in no way do I want you to hear me minimize what we think of slavery. But I do want you to understand that slavery has been different things at different times. And in that day, slavery was as common as uh, anything else in society. Let me, let me give you an example. I read somewhere that... It, the comparison of, well, today, it, we can't imagine life without cars and trucks. I mean, it's the way we live. It is our transportation. Well, imagine if for some reason, tonight when you went to bed, something happened and we woke up tomorrow, all vehicles, all automotives were just banned. You couldn't use them any longer. They, for whatever reason, put off limits. What in the world would we do? Our whole society would shut down. It would be a radical change. In some ways, that's the way the people living in the first century saw slavery. Like I said, I know that's a hard thing, and we'll talk about it another time. But this morning, I simply want you to get the fact that, that slaves in that day, you could have passed a slave in walking by them and not have known they were a slave. It was different than what we think of as the American slavery. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm simply saying you need to read it and understand a little differently. It's going to be referenced later in this, in this letter. So Paul is appealing to Philemon to see Onesimus through different eyes. He's encouraging him to view Onesimus in a way he didn't before. And in fact, as you continue to read on, you find out that in verse 12, he says, I'm sending him, Onesimus. I'm sending him, who is my very heart. Onesimus has become like a son to Paul. He loves him dearly, and he's sending him back to Philemon who was the slaveholder. He was the master. And he says, Paul says, he's my very heart. In other words, when you see him, Philemon, when he shows up at your door, I want you to look at him as if you would be looking at me. I want you to imagine that he is my representative, not just with a message, but in fact representing who I am, representing my heart. I would have liked to keep him with me so he could take your place in helping me. It tells us something about this relationship between Paul and Philemon. They had a strong relationship. And helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do 
would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Philemon, apparently, as the slaveholder, had experienced a loss. Onesimus had escaped. We don't know the details. We don't know why he escaped, but he escaped. And considering the circumstances of that day and age, he might have taken money. He might have actually stolen from his master simply to live on. And so Philemon might have had reasons to be upset with him. I mean, even if it was not like slavery in this country, he's lost a significant helper. He's lost someone who has had responsibility. And now he's without that. I mean, think about it for a minute. If you get past the American slavery, think about a, think about if you had a, a helper, a, a servant, someone you, you employed. Let me put it in that context. And all of a sudden, they just left. No notice, didn't tell you they were going, they just disappeared. And even more so, if in fact they'd stolen from you, how would you feel if they just showed up in your doorway? I don't think anybody, even if slavery was different, which it was, I don't think anybody would have expected Philemon to say, hey, great to have you back, to Onesimus when he showed up. Come on in. I don't worry about the stuff you took if in fact he took anything. Hey, don't worry about the fact that you just left me hanging. Don't worry about all the stuff I've had to cover since you've been gone. Come on back. Probably not. And in fact, again, if you knew something about, or if you know something about the first century context, Philemon, by law, could have done anything he wanted to Onesimus. I mean, anything. And I want you again to think about what I said earlier, slavery was common. Lots of people had slaves. Put yourself in those shoes, again, not the American context, but put yourself in those shoes of servants, maybe, but slaves, and imagine what's going through Philemon's mind as he's considering the fact that his runaway slave has, is going to come back to him. What are his options? What would he be doing? What would he do in result? Paul is apparently appealing to him that he receive him just as he would a dear friend. Paul is apparently asking Philemon to set aside all those thoughts that he, we would expect him to have and receive him as a brother. So what is Philemon to do? Just to just accept him? Is he just to give him his freedom? Imagine what that would set off. Imagine what that would say to the other slaves. Oh, if you want to get free, I guess you just take off and run. And go see Paul, by the way, because he can get you back in with not the old arrangement. He'd be the laughing stock. Plus the fact he might cause all kinds of problems, not only in his own household, but the whole surrounding area. Imagine how the talk would get out. Imagine how the talk would get out today. It's not a lightweight thing here. And if you read the whole passage up to where I am so far, you get the idea that Paul is really pouring it on. You might even think Paul is manipulating Philemon except for the fact that they know each other very well. And they apparently have a relationship in which Philemon also came to Christ as a result of Paul's preaching. So there's a relationship of respect. We have reason then to believe that he's listening, even though he may be struggling to understand what is this all about. And then Paul says this. Perhaps the reason he, Onesimus, was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. What? How had he all of a sudden become brothers? 
That's the message of this letter. That's the point that I think the context for what Paul is talking about to the Corinthians is so immediately relevant in this letter. Philemon is already a Christian. He's already a member of Christ's family. Now Onesimus, although he ran away, although he did what would have been considered awful and illegal, he has now in fact become a Christian. And he's apparently changed his ways and he's been serving Paul in prison. Imagine how Onesimus is feeling. You're sending me back? What? Do you know what's going to happen to me? And Paul gives as the potential reason. He doesn't say this is it. He's not like some today who say, God said you ought to do this. And he told me about it, so I'm telling you. He didn't go there. What he said was, perhaps, it's possible, maybe the reason that he was separated from you in the first place is in fact because of a bigger reason. And maybe it wasn't your doing or my doing or Philemon, or Onesimus' doing. Maybe someone else had a hand in this. If in fact, in this runaway business, Onesimus had encountered the Lord, which he apparently had through Paul's preaching, and he had been changed, radically changed, radically changed into no longer viewing the world he had once viewed it, the way he had viewed it previously. If in fact, everything about his perspective had changed, Paul is sending back a different Onesimus than left. And he's now saying, reminding really Philemon, just as when you came to the Lord, you became a member of God's family, so has Onesimus, which makes the two of you brothers. Wow, that's a lot to stomach. How am I to view Philemon now? Or excuse me, how am I to view Onesimus now? Well, who had once been my slave? Everybody here, everybody in our house knew him as a slave. All the people in the community knew him as a slave. The people in the church knew him as a slave. They knew he ran away. Maybe they knew he stole from me. And now you're asking me to receive him back as a brother? Now, granted, he never, Paul never asks him to release him. He never asks him to set him free. That's what you and I would be expecting. I, I, I know I would. Maybe you would. Surely he wants him free. Paul never mentions that. What he says is, I want you to welcome him as a brother. Not just a biological brother, but a brother in Christ. A brother in the kingdom of God. A brother in this new creation that has started. In other words, Paul is living out in his request to Philemon, the ministry of reconciliation that he was talking about to the Corinthian church. And you may know from your own reading or studying in past times that Paul says, both in Galatians and Colossians, from Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. Nor is there male and female, for we're all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's not that we stop being people. It's not that we just turn over all relationships, which is maybe why he's not even saying, I expect you to release him. Or asking him to release him. What he's saying is, the old ways of viewing status, class separations, all the barriers that we set up artificially as humans, you know, to make you look less than and me greater than, right? All those things we set up, and there's many of 
somehow all of those go away when Jesus becomes Lord. Somehow when we accept Jesus as our Lord, we are to see all those barriers, all those dividing points is no longer relevant. And we're to see each other regardless of what we do with our vocations. We're to see each other as brother and sister in Christ. Which is a relationship based on the love that God had for us. It's a radical change, folks. Again, imagine it yourself however you think of slavery. Because frankly, if you view it in the way American slavery was, it would be even more substantial because of the harsh treatment and the radical separation between people. Imagine receiving a former slave back as your brother or your sister. What does that do to you and the relationships you have with everybody that knew about that former relationship? It's a radical change. Now the point for us to take with us today is that because Jesus is still living and because Jesus is still inviting us into relationship with Him, because Jesus is still working the ministry of reconciling us to God through Him, because Jesus has given those of us who are Christians the responsibility and the privilege of trying to help others be reconciled to God through Christ. Because of all of this work of reconciliation, you and I have the responsibility to look into all of our relationships, regardless of what they are. To look at our lives around us, all the activities we participate in. And to ask ourselves this question. If this ministry of reconciliation continues, which it does, and is applying to us just like it did to him, and if Paul could ask Philemon to so radically change his perspective in real-time relationship with someone else, he's asking us to do the same. And what part of your life and mine do we need to look to change our perspective? In what relationship do we have that needs a new perspective? A perspective of love. A perspective of recognizing that that person or those people are loved by the same God with the same love that He loves you and me. And He expects us to love them that way as well. Imagine how that works out. Now, I promised you last Sunday, if you were here, when I hinted at what we were going to be talking about, and I read from 2 Corinthians and said, we are to no longer view each other from a human perspective. That this week we talk about what that looks like, act that out, live out. Well, here's an example. See, the truth is, I don't know all of your relationships. I don't know the barriers that you allow to continue to have influence. I don't know the positions of authority you may hold in different relationships. But I know that this world is built upon a value of separating us from each other. I know this world is built on values of assigning status so that you are less than me. And I know that God is against that entirely. And it's the work of reconciliation that cost Jesus his life in order that you and I might have new life. It's of the utmost importance to God that we no longer see each other with these distinctions. That we love each other. That we value each other. 
that we view each other and our way of relating to you, to each other, according to God's love and God's new creation. So your homework this week is to ask yourself the question, what barriers exist in my life? What relationships exist in my life that need a new perspective that I need to approach differently? What values do I hold with regards to other people and our place need to change? Because if we are to preach the gospel, if we are to spread the good news of what Jesus has done, only by our change in relationship and actions are our words going to matter at all. And as we change, may God receive the glory. May others come to Christ and find the true, lasting love that can change anything. Father, we pray that, that you'll take this message, this, this little